Welcome back to Walking the Line from Research to Practice. This is episode number five, and in this episode, we're going to be covering a paper on the use of single syringe adenosine uh, for hemodynamically stable supraventricular tachycardia. Now, this is a paper published by McDowell M. et al., and it's titled Single Syringe Administration of Diluted Adenosine in Academic Emergency Medicine from 2019. Now, this study was a non-inferiority randomized clinical trial. So basically what the authors were trying to do is they were trying to state that single syringe adenosine for the conversion of normal sinus rhythm versus a two syringe technique, which I'll talk about, um, basically the single syringe was non-inferior. In other words, it was just as good as, right? Not better than. And essentially for single syringe adenosine, what they did is they drew up six milligrams of adenosine and they added 18 milliliters of 0.9% sodium chloride all into one 20 cc syringe. So that's the single syringe technique. For the two syringe technique, what they used is this two syringe technique where one syringe had normal saline and the other had the six milligrams of adenosine in it, and it was connected to a three-way stopcock. And so what they did is they pushed the adenosine, turned the valve on the stopcock, and then rapidly flushed it with adenosine. So this sort of tandem technique, just to kind of give you an idea of what they were comparing. And their primary outcome was percent of patients with successful conversion of their SVT to normal sinus rhythm after one dose. And what they ended up finding is that in the single syringe group, 73.1% of patients converted to normal sinus rhythm as compared to the tandem technique, which was 40.7%. One of their secondary outcomes was successful conversion to normal sinus rhythm with up to three doses of adenosine, kind of following the basic ACLS guidelines of six milligrams followed by 12 followed by 12. And in this outcome, they found that the conversion to normal sinus rhythm was 100% with single syringe, and it was 70.4% with the tandem technique. Now, first of all, this study was completely underpowered. There was only 50 patients in the entire study. So, you know, I think we need to understand that we're talking about 25 patients per arm, and we have to be really careful because in in studies that are underpowered, we can sometimes get results that are really overwhelmingly impressive. They're, in other words, hyperinflated. And if we were to carry those studies out into a larger population, we would find that there would be this regression to the mean and we wouldn't maybe find as big a difference. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is that this was an unblinded study. And what I mean by that is that the physicians or clinicians, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew whether they were giving single syringe or they were doing two syringe technique. And the issue I have with this is that when a study is unblinded, we all have biases and those biases can affect the outcomes. So if I'm a believer in single syringe adenosine, maybe I do other things. I pay more attention to detail or I push it a little bit faster that can affect the ultimate outcome. And the reason I mention this is that there have actually been multiple studies looking at the two syringe technique in the past, and they find a conversion rate of somewhere in the 80% range to normal sinus rhythm. And in this study, it was only 40%. And so that just doesn't jive with the previous literature. And I think something that we need to really remember is that we're not evaluating any of these studies in a bubble. We're actually comparing them to previous evidence. So that already makes this study kind of not pass that sniff test for me. And then the most important thing about adenosine is we know the half-life is very short, that this has to be pushed rapidly because we want to get it into the central circulation. And one thing that we don't know in this study is we have no idea what the location of these IVs were. For all I know, the people who had the two syringe technique had all their IVs put in distally. And for everybody who had the single syringe technique, they had all their IVs put in proximally. And I'm not saying that the authors were purposely do that, but I think it's important to know where these IVs were placed because we know based on the location of the IV, that can have an effect on how well adenosine works. Now, I want to kind of take a moment and tell you that for hemodynamically stable SVT, my go-to move and medication is not adenosine, actually. And I know all the guidelines say start with adenosine. 
I actually don't. If they're hemodynamically stable, I like to try the modified Valsalva maneuver, which is basically where the patient is initially sitting up. I have them blow into a 10 or 20 cc syringe as hard as they can for 10 or 20 seconds. And then I lay them flat and I pick up their legs and hold them there for a minute. Now, I always coach the patients before I try this technique because they already don't feel good and I want them to know what's going to be happening and that this is effort dependent. It's like having somebody vagal down basically is what you're doing when you have them blow into that syringe and so that to increase that parasympathetic system, this is completely effort dependent. Now, there's been three randomized clinical trials looking at modified Valsalva maneuver and they have about a 40% conversion rate, which many of you may say, God, that's not so good. But I got to tell you, it costs nothing. It's no effort. I don't have to put an IV in a patient. I don't have to draw labs, especially if they have a history of SVT and they're not high risk like an older patient. They're like a younger patient who's had this before. And if I can get them to convert, that patient can go home. And so I, 40% is great. And if I, if I ever get SVT, that's what I would want to try first. Now, if that doesn't work, I still don't go to adenosine as my first choice or my second choice, I guess, in this matter. I go to a calcium channel blocker, and I don't want to get into a debate of calcium channel blocker versus beta blocker. It's just my practice to use calcium channel blocker. I specifically use diltiazem. Now, I do something a little bit different here. In older patients, I tend to give 10 milligrams at a time. And I wait five minutes and then I'll give another 10 milligrams. And then I'll wait five minutes and I'll give another 10 milligrams, all the way up to 40 milligrams. And the reason for this is these patients tend to have coronary disease. They tend to have more things like sick sinus syndrome. And I've actually put a handful of patients into heart block by giving them the standard 20 milligrams of diltiazem. And so my thinking is... Well, I can just stack the dose. I can always give them more, but I can't take it away once I've given it. In younger patients, I tend to give the 20 milligrams followed by 25 milligrams. And then as my third line agent, I'll go to adenosine. So I want to tell you guys a quick story about a patient that I saw recently. This is amidst the COVID pandemic. And he was a young guy, 38 years old. He gave me permission to take pictures. There's nothing that's identifying in these pictures. And he clearly comes in with SVT. You can see it on the monitor on the top left of the screen. And we tried the modified Valsalva maneuver. It didn't work. We tried diltiazem two rounds of 20 and 25 milligrams. It didn't work. And so now we were going to do adenosine. And I figured this is my chance to try this single syringe adenosine to see if it works. Now, he had told me that he had had adenosine before in the past, and the 6 milligrams has never worked for him. So we just decided to go straight to the 12. So we drew up for, uh, 12 milligrams of adenosine, which is 4 mLs, and added 16 mLs of normal saline. You can see that in the top right picture. So I walk into the room, clearly wearing my goggles and my mask. Uh, this patient did not have any risk factors for COVID. Otherwise, I would have been wearing an N95 and a gown. And I told the patient that we're going to use adenosine since nothing else really seemed to work. And the funny thing is, is he vagled from remembering getting adenosine in the past. And he basically vagled himself back into sinus rhythm before I could ever try the single syringe adenosine. And so the point of the story is, is that this medication makes people feel really bad. They actually have a visceral reaction to the medication. And when a patient already doesn't feel good and we have other options that make them not feel as bad, I would argue that that's something that we should be trying to do. So what's the bottom line for single syringe adenosine? I guess it makes sense. That it's less clunky. It, it's uh, easier to do. It's more rapid. But I think we need more evidence to really say that it's non-inferior or superior to the two syringe technique. I think if you want to try it, try it. I don't see any harm in doing it. There's far uh, bigger battles to pick in the world of clinical medicine. And so I wait for my next patient that I can try single syringe adenosine. I've actually yet to be able to try it. So that's all I have for you on this episode. Make sure you leave me your questions, thoughts, comments, and until next time.